birth mother. Uh, <laughs> I'm Carolyn. I'm Carolyn. Oh, yeah, I'm Carolyn. Yeah. Let's just go, go down the line and introduce yourselves here. Hi, I'm Tom Dugan. I play the Lone Shark guy. I'm the of CU. I'm Caroline Williams. I play Loretta. You're a lovely lass, but I have to blow up your ass. <laughs> Preview. I'm Brian Trenchard Smith. Um, committed you know, 40 crimes against cinema, and uh, these are two of them, uh, of which I am yeah, completely proud, so. Uh, uh, thank you for coming, even though you've been recorded on TV in a somewhat uh, censored form, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so, back to you. That's great. Yeah, you guys are going to, at least some of y'all are going to be able to stick around, and we'll have a little Q&A after the film. So just give them a great big hand, look out for them, and... Production, uh, filmmaker, people, crew, actors, hands up, all those who've actually been on the business end of filmmaking. Okay, well, that's great, that's great. Just wanted you to know, shot in 14 days at the uh, Master Hotel. Yeah. Uh, and then we did a, a night of, uh, of guerrilla shooting in Vegas, about which I will tell you later. Because we've been refused permission in what you do when you, know, you are denied something. You it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What? Thank you. Tom. Tom, are you here? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've seen the movie all the way through. <laughs> that bullshit, bullshit, my part. <laughs> How long had it been since you guys had seen the film? I actually saw it about three or four months ago when my 15-year-old uh, snagged a copy of it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and I came home and he was lying on the sofa going, Mom, you're about to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> so we watched and enjoyed. It was a special moment. That's right. That's right. No, wait, how many days did you say it took you to shoot this? Um, 14. Um, cost a, picture cost a million too. Because, number two had not done uh, the business they expected. They thought, oh, okay, well, we'll just make another one. We'll have a three, and we have a franchise, and that's the end of it. And they pretty much left us alone. And you know, the idea was, you know, take the leprechaun to Vegas, the capital of greed, uh, and have some fun and make sure we have some theme rooms. Uh, quite obsessed with theme rooms, they were. Um, we couldn't really afford very elaborate theme rooms. Uh, so, uh, you know, we did, you know, we shot at the Ambassador Hotel. Um, virtually everything is shot there, except for all those obvious uh, street scenes uh, in Vegas. Uh, and, uh, but it, it was very interesting. I, I, I got a sense that there was a real public for leprechaun films in Vegas when people started following us around. Uh, and say, are you making a leprechaun movie? Can we be in it? And I said, oh, free extras. Um, very good. Okay, would you mind just walking down there and you guys cross over when I give you a hand wave and, and you don't see the leprechaun. And we pan down and see and there we go. And so, yeah, we did things like that. And the, go the, the golden nugget had turned us down for location, so I put him right outside with a nice 14 mil lens to make him look big. And, uh, oh, Colton, look at I like one of those, you see. So we had fun, we had fun. The only thing we didn't shoot in the end was the, him with the hooker, uh, where uh, she, she, she offered him a, a golden shower. And he said, <laughs> golden shower? I like one of those. Uh, and so which she replies, you know, okay, but you buy the six pack. Uh, anyway, but, but, um, I'm noted for my good taste, and uh, uh, so we, we, we did not include that. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> uh, one of the moments from the film that stands out for me is, um, God bless Joe Demita, in the scene where we're in the dressing room and I kick the door closed, for, somehow his finger got caught in the door. Oh, yeah. I took the top of his middle finger right off. Oh. We were at Good Samaritan Hospital till 4 a.m. He had a new baby. I don't know how many more scenes we had to shoot. 
The guy didn't miss a moment. That guy was there, he was doing that gig, and I felt like shit the whole time. Oh. I took his finger <laughs> clean off. Or, or he did or no, no, no. Joe Demita, who played Fazio. The Fazio. Oh. Now. Yeah. My, uh, my, uh, first, my, my memory is of the audition. And I said to Brian, I said, listen, this, this, these sides, uh, I can't, I don't think I can make these funny. Can I make up stuff? <laughs> he said, all right, all right. So I made up stuff. And he says, all right, you've got the part, but you have to make up all of your lines. <laughs> Better than what we'd written. And it, it's the most relaxing gig I've ever had in my life, because I could just make up what I had to say. And, and, and thank you so much for it. And when they shot their scenes, whenever, the, whenever you and that other guy were shooting those scenes, and I hate to call him that other guy, because he's an actor and he was really great. But everyone, everybody from the cast, the crew, craft service, everybody's watching. And you want to laugh your ass off, but there's sound rolling. So everybody's walking around. <laughs> yeah, that was so it. funny. I mean, the, the one about the the, the you know jockeys and uh, <laughs> ha hanging loose. Um, I, I, that was just something uh, that came at the spur of the moment because these guys are so fabulous. I just wanted more of them in the picture. So uh, we had it was 15 minutes to wrap, uh, and I thought, well, we we got through the day's schedule. Let's just. Do something while they're they're waiting to go and kill Mickey Callum. Let's let's do something. Uh, and uh, so I you know, said, stand here. I put two cameras on them uh, and just said, you know, you're, you're you're making small talk. Go for it. And that's what they did. Uh, and and I, I thought it was fabulous. And literally, we did it in 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, and, and then I had to fight to keep it in the cut. Uh, but but luckily, you know, they they saw the wisdom of it. And you had said well, after we did it, you said, oh, I get it. You're doing a whole pulp fiction thing. <laughs> and I said. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a bit of good fellas in there too. But I, 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 one thing, the last thing I wanted to share was I had a wonderful conversation with Warwick Davis, and and he was standing there in his full regalia, and we were about to shoot one of the scenes on the crap table, and uh, and we were talking about how he had done something, you know, uh, Medea in 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 uh, the West End with uh, Dame Judy Dench and, and, and we had finished and then he said kindly he said would you mind picking me up and putting me on the floor <laughs> and I've never had to do that with another actor <laughs> oh that's, that's all I got Warwick was wonderful. I mean, he was a real trooper. See, that makeup uh, took two and three quarter hours to put on uh, when we'd really got it down. I mean, first up, it was like three and a half hours. And then we, uh, it takes 45 minutes to come off. Uh, so all of that had to be factored into the 12-hour day, you know, an actor being on an eight-hour day plus overtime. So uh, it, he, yeah. It got, you know, I know that after a certain number of pictures, it was really tough for him to go through that process day after day after day. But he was a very good sport, and he really appreciated me letting him do a bit of improv as well. I wrote all uh, the, the rhyming dialogue. <laughs> Actually, I think I should be declared Poet Laureate for next year. I might do better than the current guy. Uh, but... Uh, and the limerick. Uh, I, 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 I'm rather fond of dirty limericks, uh, and I may tell one and later. Uh, I'm curious to... Um, were you given... Tell, tell one, one now. now. Do it, do it, do it. Uh, let me think. Um, there was a gay man from Khartoum who took a lesbian up to his room. They spent the whole night in a terrible fight about who would do what and with which and to whom. <laughs> I probably enraged the entire game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, hey, look, I, I've made a gay submarine movie and a lesbian Rambo movie. I'm an equal opportunity <laughs> assembler. <laughs> Let, let's, let's see the end of this prejudice once and for all. 
I have a lyric too. There once was a man from Devizes whose balls were of two different sizes. The one was so small it was no ball at all, but the other one won several prizes. <laughs> This could get considerably worse. There was, there was a young man from Dubas who had two balls of brass. When he clanged them together, they played stormy weather and lightning shot out of his eyes. Oh. Hey, well, I wish I'd used that version. Come on, that's great. Um, I have one more question, and then we'll open up to the audience. That was so much better than like a high school. Oh, look at this! It's New Orleans now. Um, I'm just curious, what instructions were you given, if any, as far as like how to treat the character and the franchise when you were taking over? Well, you know, they, they, they kind of... It, it's kind of lost interest, you know, it's number three, it's going to be the last one, and it turns out to be the uh, highest selling directed video of, no, of 95. Yeah, it's all, uh, I think, 55,000 copies of VHS, and in those days, for something that never had a theatrical release and went straight to, to, uh, DV, to, to, to VHS, that was yeah, a considerable number. Uh, so, you know, that it, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it was, it led to a leprechaun in space, but that is another story. <laughs> Which we will get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I couldn't get an audition for. Oh. What? Oh. You were dead! Oh. What? There's no old charts in space. Well. <laughs> but, however, if I'd made my dream leprechaun movie, which I had offered, uh, Leprechaun in the White House, <laughs> uh, oh. There's still time. There's still time. It's funny. I mean, I, after Leprechaun in Space, they, I, I suggested a, you know, Leprechaun in the White House. You know, the, the big spaceship you know, spits him out down onto the roof of the White House like Independence Day, and he had a block of ice, and he pours out, and he gets into the, the drywall and the, the air conditioning pipes, and he discovers a president with a zipper problem, and evil Republicans uh, prowling the place looking to take him down, and, and he hears about Fort Knox and gold, gold. So it's not going to go on like that. And they just thought that that was maybe a little too wacky after Leprechaun in Space. So they, they turned it down and they went for Leprechaun in the Hood, which was a good thing. Uh, but, uh, uh, but 18 months later, um, when the Monica Lewinsky thing broke, um, yeah, well, well I, just, I just called the head of Trimark on his private line and left a message on his voicemail after hours saying, Hi, remember me? You know, I had this idea about Leprechaun in the White House. Um, wouldn't you like to have had a thousand prints ready for release right now? Uh, I never got a reply. Uh, Still say there's time. Somebody the head of Trimark right now, his private phone is a is is a, uh, a pay phone. <laughs> Trimark now has no more. Well, yeah, right. well I, I think Trimark is part of Lionsgate now, so it's a, and uh, uh, so is my percentage. Uh, <laughs> I guess let's open it up to the audience. Uh, can we get the house lights up? Anyone up there? Well, I see your hand. Uh, I thought it was a great movie on its own merits and a hell of a lot of fun, but um, you know, I'm really curious. For 14 days of shooting. That's seriously fucking impressive. Yeah. With all the effects and, and the performances are great and the, the ideas and concepts were, were fantastic. So I'm curious for your process, what do you do in the planning stages to be able to only do 12 hour days and get through oh, something no, like that in 14 hours? Well, there, 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 were, there were a few 14 hour days, uh, but I, I hate that and it's tough on people and I worry about people driving home. That's and uh, you know, we, we have, yeah, yeah, we were on the 14th hour. On the, when, when, when the finger came off, but we, we, it was sewn back on again, and, uh, and, and you know, it hasn't, hasn't cramped his style doing voiceovers since. Um, so, um, <laughs> now, John did a great job, and I cast him in uh, my guilty pleasure, Megiddo, uh, and, uh, and he is, he is a great actor. But anyway, it, it, discipline. I think, it, it, first of all, you've you, you got to have a passion for, you know, what, the, the essence of what the project is, and I saw, I, I looked at the previous Leprechaun movies, and I said, well, they're neither scary nor are they funny enough 
uh, so let's sort of ramp it up. And uh, the powers that be said, okay, okay, whatever. Uh, and that was fine. Uh, and then in the next one, you say, I ramped it up even more, and possibly too much. You'll probably, uh, whether you like the next one as much as you like this one, I don't know. So some people do, some people don't. But the balance is that, that, that three is better than four. Uh, but uh, it's discipline. It's, it's visualizing the scene. I, I come from an editorial background. Uh, so I, I see a scene in terms of a succession of shots of you know, where we drop back in perspective, where we go in, uh, and you know, what little points need to be emphasized by inserts. And in this kind of a movie, obviously, you, you need to point up all the magic and all the shtick with, these, with the insert shots. So I would write a shot list. I don't storyboard. I just write a shot list. And I then may vary it, change it, subtract, add, or whatever on the day. Uh, and it's a skillful use of second unit with a list of shots to pick up after we leave the set. I mean, I started the second unit uh, a, a day after we started and three hours each day after we started. So they would go on for another three hours and I would straddle both units. And the, the latter, they would be delivering those difficult shots of application of makeup and you know, the, the things that take a while to set up. Uh, and uh, I just go back and forth. So it's, it's a matter of planning and visualization and then you know, hopefully being a good brigade commander on set and uh, choreographing you know, the, the logistics of the exercise with the aid of really good ADs and, and a good UPM. And plus I think everybody, I think everybody was having such a great time. I, I never heard people complaining, not in the crew, not in the cast, except when I did the finger thing. And he complained a little bit. He complained a little bit. But uh, for the most part, we were really romping and stomping and having a great time. And the scenes were fun. And, you know, I, I've never had so much fun. I was really sad when it was over. Yeah. I mean, I, I think movies should be fun to make. Uh, and he, no one does their best work in an atmosphere of fear and blame, which I suspect exists uh, at the highest level, the very hierarchical uh, level where there's so much money at stake. Uh, and so, but I luckily make films you know, where you know, they don't seem to care if we have fun and we stop and tell a joke every now and again. But people give their best work when they feel encouraged to be part of the process, and I, you know, if, 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 if the PA has a suggestion for me, uh, I'll listen, you know, I, I don't care, I've still got my vision, still what I want to do, but if someone can make my idea better, whoopee, you know. Uh, so, hey. now, who's next? I see a hand back there. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm a very large fan of Mr. Warwick Davis. I was wondering if you had any, like, legends to share about uh, Well, he's one of the nicest guys you could ever wish to meet. Uh, and, yeah, he's a perfect gentleman. He's always very prepared and always very professional and puts up with all that makeup stuff and, and the glue that really gets you after a while. Uh, and, you know, he's just a really decent fellow, very quiet, unassuming, uh, and, uh, but a good sense of humor. He knows a good joke when, when he sees it. Uh, and, you know, I, he's a really good actor, so in the next one I sort of gave him a bit of Shakespeare to do, you know, we, we sort of exhausted rhymes, so you know, we'd pillage a, a better writer than ourselves. Uh, but, uh, but really, I mean, he's just a decent fellow, uh, and, you know, we, we had a lot of laughs and good times together. Now, I don't know if, if he shared this with you, but on our, on our moment of discussion on the craps table, uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he says, you know, this leprechaun thing, I'm, this is, I'm done with this. This is, this is, I'm moving on to more serious stuff after this. This is the last one I'm going to do. Now, he did th three more, right? Well, you know, I think they made him an offer that uh, he, he couldn't refuse. And, and you know, and, and one thing I, I can tell you about Warwick, uh, when I was over in England doing Britannic in 99, uh, he, you know, he lived uh, not far away from the studio. Uh, and I learned that from him that he had a side business of doing corporate and industrial uh, videos, uh, <laughs> which he would direct, produce, uh, uh, and edit himself. Uh, and he had a whole little post-production setup. Uh, so yeah, it's very smart of him to put the money that he made in, in, in acting uh, into a side business 
and, and one that had nothing to do with his stature and just had to do with his brain. Uh, so I commend him tremendously for that. We're supposedly going to have uh, the new Ricky Gervais, Stephen Mer Merchant show is going to be starring him. Yeah, I think, well, I, I think he was in extras. He played mm -hmm. himself the total opposite of what Warwick is. He played you know, himself uh, he, uh, he, in a somewhat egotistical, uh, uppity fashion. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that is not Warwick. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, I hope he goes on doing interesting parts for the rest of his, his life. I know he wanted to do a series of books about a little person private eye. Uh, but, uh, and I think Ron Howard was interested in that at one point, but gee, I'd love to see you know, him do something like that, and that would be, it would champion the little person uh, and, and uh, show little, little people are heroes without having to be, let's say, grotesque uh, as they are here. Uh, what was that, uh, that movie where the dwarf... Um, the no, no, no. <laughs> Tom DeChilio, what, what, what... what the, Living in oblivion. I'm sorry. I saw it in Canada, and it kind of makes you forget. Uh, but uh, but it, it was. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it, the, you know, when when the, the the little person has this big speech about how dwarves are used in movies, uh, I thought that was yeah. You know, I, I th there was a certain sort of resonance in that that uh, was true, and uh, I I yeah I enjoyed that speech. Anyway, you talk for a bit. Well, let's do one last question, and then we will go to the intermission. I see a hand over there. I was wondering if it was a conscious decision to pass the queen of the horror movie sequels, and uh, how long it took to blow her up. <laughs> the queen of horror movie sequels. Uh, and is that really who I am? <laughs> oh, God. I do have a resume riddled with Roman numerals. <laughs> well, she was great. Great in The Stepfather. I've never forgotten her in The Stepfather. And I was able to give little guest parts, uh, unpaid, uh, to my Demons Girls, two, three of my Daughters of Darkness from Night of the Demons 2. Uh, you know, and, and a cast member, you know, playing the priest, of course, because he was the priest in uh, in Demons, and he had these two floozies on his arm, and he's he's winning. So they just, they, yeah, they, they they said, can we be in the movie? And I said, I haven't got any parts for you. We'll find something. So so we just did that little bit. They came in, and uh, you know, they went in and out in an hour. But uh, yeah, I you know, I like to work with people that I've worked with before who who are great, and so. You know, they were kind of like a, a, a mascot in uh, in the next Blue Rider, Brian Trenchard Smith film. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it was yeah, it was a fun, it was a really fun experience, and as films should be. Yeah. What about you? How how long did it take to blow up your ass? To blow, well, I mean, it was a lot of appliances, and I had to. Gabe did a whole body cast, and he still has my panties hanging off of the head of a moose in his shop. And but that's for other reasons. That's what I was stuck. Um, gosh, it took a long time. The most embarrassing thing about that part of the shoot wasn't the shoot itself or any of the makeup or any of those things. I'm sitting with Warwick. We're, bo we're both in full drag. I'm reading the Wall Street Journal. He's reading the Financial Times. We've got our papers up, and I hear a voice say, um... Caroline, and we drop our newspapers, and it's me, my the guy I've been dating for four months. <laughs> <laughs> he was an executive at Universal Studios. They've been working on Apollo 13. Ron Howard, Ward Davis, and behind my guy I've been dating for four months is Ron Howard. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and I had read for him for Apollo 13, and he didn't hire me. And there I am, and I thought, I wonder if it's like hiding behind a bush, having all this makeup on. Maybe he doesn't really recognize me. I know who I am. But that was, <laughs> that was an interesting moment. <laughs> Uh, yes, it was. Yeah, it was fun to blow up her ass. I must. Admit. So, it was fun. Yeah, and there we were in the Ambassador Hotel, which yeah, funny. I arrived in uh, in L.A. for the very first time uh, in 1968, the morning after Robert Kennedy was shot. Oh. Yeah, and there we are in the Ambassador Hotel, and we're in the kitchen. Oh. The morgue was staged in the kitchen, where there is an X marked on the spot where his head lay, just bef uh, before the by the elevator before they could move him down. So we felt, you know, we felt 
Agreed. If I'd known, uh, I would have chosen another location. It was, it, you know, it, I just had no idea. And then we found out when we were shooting there uh, that, that otherwise I would have avoided the kitchen and uh, done something else. So, you know, it's funny, you know, it's uh, six degrees of separation. Um, I have something good related to yeah. that. There was a rose garden out by the ambassador, and there were a few movies, two or three movies being shot at the time that, that we were there. And it, we're sitting outside on a break, and this rose garden had died. And the roses had all hipped out, made those little pods. And I found it, the security guard said they were Robert F. Kennedy roses. It was a hybrid that was made right after his assassination. And I snipped those little hips, and I took them home, and I planted them, and they grew. And so at my old house, along the back uh, wall of our old house, I have these beautiful Robert F. Kennedy roses, and I buried my son's foreskin after his breast back. <laughs> It grew into an enormous tree. <laughs> Huge. And I have lots of hanging fruit. <laughs> thank you so thank you so much guys. I got uh give them a big hand. I got three announcements, two about the front of the house, one about the back. In the front of the house, we have both versions of the Leprechaun poster. Yeah, I'm gonna do some business. These are amazing. They're for sale up there. There's some people here who might be willing to sign them. Uh, both amazing pieces of art in, in uh, very different styles. At least one of these fits in your house right now. And the last announcement and most important, the bar is now open. Let's enjoy it. Aaron Govralis.